Hi everyone. Uh, so we're going to try this out today. I'm recording a lecture now at home on a webcam, so apologies for the low quality. It's uh, not exactly the ideal setup, but I can't get to campus in weather like this, so this is what we're going to have to deal with. Uh, yeah. So uh, today I'm going to be covering, I guess, the I'm, I'm going to pick up a little bit on what we left off on the last lecture, which we ended up on three point four point bending, uh, and then I'll go into strain gauges, which are kind of an important part of what you'll need to know for the beam bending lab uh, if you haven't started it already. So in the last lecture we had touched, uh, we we talked about three point and four point bending. Uh, three point and four point bending. I will try to. I have I have written nice written down copies of these notes that I'll try to scan and put online. Hopefully tomorrow, if campus opens back up. But I wanted to get this video online today. So on three point and four point bending, we had looked at. If we have a rod with a simple supported condition here, uh, fix on a roller here with a P down in the middle, uh, then we get some sort of a load distribution. Let's say this is length L. The P is being applied at some L over 2. Uh, we get some uh, moment equation moment is equal to uh, minus or p p x over two and then p l minus x over two between zero less than or equal to x less than l over two uh, and l over two is less than x is less than l, so I'm equal to l, and then some max deflection, max deflection in the center, uh, w l over two, uh, is equal to p l cubed over forty eight e i. Um, this is probably a little bit too small to actually see on this thing, because it's not very high resolution, unfortunately. Um, let's see. Let's erase these. Yeah, cubes. That's probably a little bit better. Um, and then for four-point bending, Now we have the load being distributed at two points over the middle. If I have some p, this ends up being p over two on one side. On the other, uh, if we take this to be a beam of length L, this load is then being applied at a distance A away from our endpoints, also A, and we're taking it to be symmetric in the beam. Um, then my bending moment M um, is a piecewise thing uh, PA over 2 PA uh, sorry let's make this bigger so this bending moment uh, is Px over 2. I don't know if I actually made that bigger at all. Uh, Pa over 2 and P um, L minus x over 2 again uh, for ooh, yeah, that should work. Um, for 0 is less than x up to a, uh, a is less than x is less than l minus a, and l minus a 
less than uh, x is less than l. So if you remember, this looks uh, something like this, our moment diagram, where this is the x direction, this is some distance l, this is our l minus a, this is some a, that didn't go away very well, um, this is our m, and our m in the center is PA, PA over 2. Um, so now, the basically the advantage of this four-point bending test is that we get this nice uniform stress throughout the, the middle of this gauge section here. Um, our maximum deflection now, W max, is also in the center, W at L over 2 is equal to now kind of a, a little bit uglier of an equation PA over 48 EI this is now an L3 L squared minus 4 A squared and as a sanity check if we plug A as L over 2 uh, which what, meaning that um, these are both applied kind of in the center of this thing. Uh, these end up back at what we had previously. So now um, in the bending lab we have both a three and a four point bending configuration. Uh, and in those configurations there's a few strain gauges on our sample. So we have a beam Let's draw a beam now in 3D, which some of you have hopefully already done this lab, some of you may not have done it yet. Um, here there's a couple supports now in the middle of the beam. Or, sorry, in the neutral axis of the beam. Um, and then there's either a three or a four point bending load being applied to this and then there's strain gauges one on the top oh, let's draw this guy one on the top one on the bottom side one on the front side and then one further from the center so we have strain gauge rosettes here at some distance L over 2 some distance slightly more than L over 2, so um, I think in the lab it's a G2 over here, some G4 distance away, um, and each of these gauges are, are strain rosettes. So this is kind of the big part of what I wanted to talk about today is how you actually analyze a strain gauge rosette and what you do with that. So strain gauges, let's talk about strain gauges. I'm going to pull out some extra paper too just in case. Okay, so let's talk about strain gauges because this is a very important part of your data analysis. So, strain gauges now look something like this. I'm going to draw a little schematic. Um, but basically there, there's some type of a metal that's kind of wound up in this accordion-like structure. Uh, I don't know if you can actually see that very well in the image. But um, maybe make it bigger later. Um, but here the idea is um, in a metal when you strain a metal the resistivity will change so what these strain gauges do is as I take this and I apply some strain some strain in the axial direction 
there'll be a corresponding change in electrical resistivity. Change in resistivity. There we go. So there's some corresponding change in resistivity as I strain the strain gauge. Um, you'll notice that there's this. They have a very specific accordion-like structure because that means that in the transverse direction there's very very little stiffness so it's able to deform really easily in the transverse direction and it actually doesn't really strain the material very much strain the, the constituent material much um, but when it's strained along this axial direction these long uh, long wires basically get stretched out and so it has a very large or large relatively large change in resistivity when strained axially and almost no change when strained in the opposite direction, or similarly when strained in shear. So um, the important thing to keep in mind about these strain gauges is they can only sense can only sense strain axially. So that means when I look at my strain tensor, these are written out in 2D. Um, if I have some x, gamma x, y, gamma x, y, epsilon y, the only thing a strain gauge is reading out is this component. Um, everything else, it's it's unable to read. So that when it when it gives you out some some value of strain, it's only that one component. So what we do, um, what we do to actually figure out what the strain is in a body, because strain, even so, these are these are applied on surfaces. So you're still just looking at a 2D strain state. But to figure out what that 2D strain state is on the surface, we make rosettes. So strain gauge, strain gauge rosettes. And what these are, are you take strain gauges, multiple ones, and stack them up together, normally either into this sort of a configuration, a 0, 45, 90, where here the strain gauge is oriented here, where this is oriented at 0 degrees, this one is then at 45 degrees and this one is a 90 degree strain gauge um, or sometimes you'll see configurations where this is a, a 0, 120, 240 um, so, so three evenly placed around in a circle uh, each forming a 120 degree angle the ones for your lab are oriented in this configuration so 0, 45, 90 um, and so these are the ones that we'll be talking about today. So what we're doing when we place these strain gauges out here uh, is then we need to think about, basically we'll, we'll be doing strain transformations. So remember this is only getting us the axial component, that R sigma x, in the direction of the strain gauge. And so what you need to do is once you get a strain value, you need to then transform that strain into the, into the correct orientation to figure out what the actual strains are, what the actual 2D strain state is in your material. So, ooh, sorry, almost had to sneeze. It may come in a second. Oh, there it is. Okay, so if you remember, um, we had our stress transformation equations that we had talked about uh, a while ago. The strain transformation equations are, are very similar um, or nearly identical. Uh, so strain transformation equations strain transformation equations here um, if you remember transforming in 2D from uh, with a given strain epsilon, uh, epsilon x, gamma x, y, and epsilon y, 
the strain in a new rotated orientation. Um, so if this, let's say this is some orientation x, y, if I then want to find the strains in a new orientation x prime, y prime, some rotated coordinate system, um, I can say epsilon x prime, oh, can we actually read that? Maybe. Can sort of read it. Um, is one half epsilon x plus epsilon y um, do plus one half epsilon x minus epsilon y cosine of two theta, then plus gamma x y over two sine of two theta. I'm running off the end of the page there. Um, similarly for epsilon y, this is one half epsilon x plus epsilon y minus one half epsilon x minus epsilon y cosine of two theta plus, or no, minus here, gamma x y over two sine of two theta and we can get our gamma x prime y prime is equal to negative epsilon x minus epsilon y sine of two theta plus gamma x y cosine of two theta. So when we get some strain components um, in some orientation, these are our transformation equations that we can use to flip them around to a new configuration. But remember now, from our strain gauge, we're only getting one of these components. We're only getting this epsilon x. If we put it at a 90 degree angle, then we're only getting epsilon x and epsilon y. But there's no actual way to get gamma xy from a strain gauge. Um, so that's a little bit of a trick. So how do we actually figure out now what our strain gauges are going to give us? Or how, how do we figure out what our, what our strain state is from these three strain gauge configurations? So let's look at this uh, slightly differently. Let's, I'm, I'm going to look at this now in a, in a Moore's circle configuration, except the, the Moore's circle for strain. So um, what I want to consider now Let's say Moore's circle Moore's circle representation. Uh, what I want to be thinking about is what the strains are relative to the principal strain axes. So if I have now, let's say I just have one strain gauge. So there are, there is some principal strain, epsilon 1, epsilon 2, and I have some strain gauge in some orientation that's at an angle theta a rel the, relative to the principal strain directions. I don't know what this theta a is, I just know that it is um, that there, it is at some angle relative to the principal strains. That could be zero, it could be 45, 90, 60, whatever. Um, when I look at this in the strain, in the more circle strain space, so our strain space now, what we're basically doing is we're saying here I have my axial strains along one axis, my uh, shear strains along the other axis, so we're plotting this in, in axial and shear strain space. I'm going to pull out what this strain gauge is going to give me is some strain in it, some strain component epsilon a, where this now is an axial strain. Um, so I have now some component epsilon a in this strain space, but I don't know what my shear is, I don't know what my second strain is. So all I know is that I have a strain that exists somewhere in this line. 
I don't know what gamma is, and again, I can't draw a more circle out because I, I only have one spot, one spot on my x-axis, and I don't even know where it is in my y-space. Let's say instead now I have two strain gauges oriented at 90 degrees relative to each other. So still in my principal strain space, epsilon 1, epsilon 2, or some with some principal strain directions, now I have a strain gauge here and a strain gauge here. Two oriented 90 degrees relative to each other. This now is still at some angle theta a. And my second strain gauge um, relative to horizontal, this is theta a plus 90 degrees or this is my theta b. Um, now in, in more circle strain space, what I'm going to get do, do, do. hopefully this thing is still recording. I think it's still recording. Looks like it is. I guess we'll find out. Um, what I'm going to look at in more circle strain space now, shear versus axial strain, um, is this is going to give me some strain in the A direction, strain in the B direction. This is epsilon A. This I'm going to call it epsilon B. I still don't actually know where along these lines my strain is. So my strain can exist anywhere in here. But I do know, because these are oriented 90 degrees relative to each other, that now the center of my Mohr circle is going to be in the middle of these two. So I have some C, and I know that these two are going to be oriented 90 degrees, which is 180 degrees relative to each other in Mohr circle space. So these here now, this is my 2 theta line, which is uh, 180 degrees because these are 90 degrees relative to each other. So these these can exist basically anywhere along these lines. So I don't know exactly where these are going to be. I just know that there could be these might be principal strains, so I could have I could have a circle here um, if they're if they exist somewhere up here, I could have a circle that looks something like this. Um, but I do know now that this C is the center of my circle. Um, and I don't know, I need to find out where exactly this circle lies. So what we do is then we take a third spot, or a third strain gauge in there. We're going to do it at 45 degrees because that makes the analysis, the analysis somewhat easier. Epsilon 2. Um, strain gauge here, and another strain gauge here at a 45 degree relative to these two. So this now is some theta A. This guy is oriented at some theta B equals theta A plus 45 degrees. Um, and then this one now is oriented at some theta c, if I can write things out properly, theta c is equal to theta a plus 90 degrees. So these are now my strain gauges along here. And so from this, now in our Mohr circle space, All I'm getting are three axial strains. So um, this is my epsilon, this is my gamma. I'm getting some epsilon a, some, I'm, I'm changing the notation here, this is epsilon c now. Um, sorry for switching it up, um, just because a, b, c is a little bit more sensical. Um, some epsilon b, and now I can draw a circle in more space. 
so I know that I'll have some center where these now these points now connect through that um, like this is a solid line center here this is going to make some circle around here let's draw this like that not a perfect circle well it's not a very good circle at all um, apologies for the very awkward circle let's see if I can clean this up a little bit uh, I don't want to do this okay, something like that that's still not super circular you get the idea um, but now the idea here is I have three points along this circle so here I have an epsilon A which coincides with some point here uh, an epsilon C which coincides and an epsilon B which coincide these are 180 degrees relative to each other and these are all now 90 degrees relative to each other so I have even though I only have three points, three axial strain points in my space, I know that with three axial points I can still define a circle because I know that the center of that circle is somewhere between these two, between that epsilon A and epsilon C. So now my with my Moore's circle equations turn into something that looks like my C, the center of my circle uh, is epsilon A plus epsilon B over 2, that's my center, and then the circle has some radius r, where that r now is equal to uh, the square root of 1 half epsilon a plus epsilon, no, minus epsilon b squared plus 1 half epsilon b minus epsilon c squared that gets cut off there a little bit at the end um, but so even though these strain gauges again are only capturing axial strains they're only capturing epsilon a b and c I can still figure out what strains they are relative to um, what what where my Moore circle space is based on the fact that I can draw a circle with three points um, to write out these transforms a little bit more formally, we can look instead at transform. We can look at, I guess, an example of this um, in terms of our our plane strains. So, uh, or in terms of our principal strains. Sorry. Um, so, example using um, three gauges. Uh, at uh, theta a is zero degrees, um, theta b, or at some, sorry, theta a, theta a plus 45 degrees, and theta a plus 90 degrees. So at some zero, 45, and 90 configuration for strain gauges. Um, now we can write this out a little bit more formally and we can say we have some I know this is my epsilon a I'm going to define this now in terms of principal stresses so if I go back um, to my epsilon x remember this is the one component that's pulling out my epsilon x from our strain transformation equations now I'm going to define this in terms of principal strains. So this is epsilon one, epsilon two, and you know in principal strain space there's no gamma x y. So I know that this gauge again is at some angle theta a relative to my principal strains. So I know that my epsilon a in terms of my principal strains is epsilon one plus epsilon two over two plus epsilon one minus epsilon two over 2. This is now cosine of 2 theta a. Um, and then there's no third component here because there's no shear component because these are principal strains. My epsilon b similarly 
is epsilon 1 plus epsilon 2 over 2 plus epsilon 1 minus epsilon 2 over 2 times cosine. Now this is 2 theta a plus 45 degrees. Um, remember, because this is still my sigma x equation, because uh, these are these are still only measuring that st sigma x axial strain. Um, just now, I'm using the same equation, but I know it's at an angle 45 degrees different. Um, and then my epsilon c is epsilon one, epsilon two over two plus epsilon one minus epsilon two over two cosine of 2 theta a plus 90 degrees. So here now these, I have three unknowns. I don't know what epsilon 1 or epsilon 2 are, and I don't know what my theta a is. So I don't know exactly what my strain values are or what their angle is relative to the principal strains, but uh, now that I have three strain equations, I can plug, I can do some algebraic manipulation, get these all together, and what I end up with was um, what I end up with is my sigma or my epsilon one and two, my principal strains, are equal to um, epsilon a plus epsilon c over two uh, plus or minus for the first and second principal strains. Uh, uh, let's say this is 1 over root 2, then the square root of half epsilon a minus epsilon b squared um, plus 1 half epsilon b minus epsilon c squared, where this is all still under the, still under the square root here. I just kind of moved it down. Um, and then my theta a now, uh, I can figure out is one half inverse tangent of um, epsilon a minus two epsilon b plus epsilon c over epsilon a minus epsilon c. So you'll notice that in here, this square root is the same as our, our radius of our Mohr circle. Here, the center is the same, or this, this first term is the same as our center of our Mohr circle, our Mohr strain circle. Um, so, and then our, our theta here, you could also get from geometric analysis of this guy. Um, yeah, so these are, these are effectively representing the same thing. Uh, just one is, this is kind of the mathematical way this is derived. Um, and then this is kind of a graphical way that this is derived that you can see a little bit easier. Uh, there's just for a couple quick examples now. Um, so our, our Mohr circle now, the, there's a couple special cases that you may end up with um, if you have strain gauges aligned example uh, strain gauges uh, lined with principal strains so this could be um, you could end up with uh, Say on your gauges, you ended up with something like this, um, where this is epsilon a, epsilon c, uh, and epsilon b. If, say, your epsilon a was equal to 2 epsilon b and epsilon c was 0, uh, then you know that your, well, that looks very fuzzy. There we go. Um, still fuzzy. Uh, just poor resolution. Um, so, if you happen to have 
the epsilon a and F, epsilon c is zero, you know your epsilon a is aligned along here, and your epsilon or epsilon a is two epsilon b, you know that you're kind of in this strain space. Um, if you had uh, something that looked like this. This would be epsilon a, epsilon c, epsilon b. So you know if your epsilon a equals negative epsilon c um, and epsilon b is equal to zero, your strain gauges are then um, still oriented. These are still your principal strains, um, and it just happens to be symmetric about here. Um, yeah, so these are these are I guess a couple special strain cases um, that you can be looking out for, um, just as kind of a if you if you don't want to go through the full. For, so these these formal transformations always work, um, but if you just want to if you end up seeing something like this, um, you know kind of where your strains are um, in your space. And you don't necessarily have to do that much calculation. Um, yeah. So, uh, in your lab, just as a reminder now, so you have you have zero, forty-five, and ninety degree strain gauge rosettes here on on each of these spaces. Um, you'll be measuring what their values are. Your here, epsilon x, epsilon y, and um, some strain gauge at 45 degrees relative to them. When you're measuring out those values, it's it's just very important to keep in mind the strain gauge at 45 degrees is not giving you a shear strain explicitly. It's still giving you an axial strain, and you need to go through these strain transformation equations, um, these guys here, uh, to figure out exactly what your strain space is or what your strains look like. It should be a little bit more straightforward because you know um, the stress state that you're applying and you and using your analytic formulas you should know what strains you can expect. So along the neutral axis there should be no uh, strain in the x-direction but um, I guess there may be a strain actually along the neutral axis there should be no strain in the y-direction either but there should be a shear um, so you may um, you may end up with kind of one of these nice cases along the top and bottom and other sides. Um, your your strain in the y direction for for these. So your strain along the beam is coming from a bending moment. Your strain um, orthogonal to the beam direction, remember, is coming from a Poisson's ratio expansion. Um, and then you either have tension or compression on the top or bottom, depending on, I guess, here this would be tension on the bottom and compression on the top, um, and the shear wouldn't be acting in this plane, so you shouldn't have a shear contribution, you should only have an axial strain contribution, so you, you should hopefully be able to figure out analytically what these are without too much problem, but just always keep in mind what your strain gauges are actually measuring and how to go about figuring out your strain state from those. Okay, so here I'm going to stop this video and I'm going to record another one talking about plasticity. Um, yeah, and then I'll, I'll... I don't have a scanner to... I guess I have, I have nice clean versions of the notes uh, that I'll post online a little bit later, probably Wednesday, but I won't be able to get those out until I get to a scanner. So this is going up today just so you all have it for the data analysis for the lab. All right.